friends, welcome to the All Canadian Reptile Girl. I'm Annalise, and today we are going to be talking about one of my all time favorite snake species. Garter snakes. No, not garter snakes. Doom rolls bows. No, not doom rolls bows either. Do you not know what we're filming? Did you read the script? Uh, no, I got a job. Okay, so it's look, king snakes? No! no. Alright, look, just. Shh. Anyway. Okay, I get it. I have a lot of one of my favorite snake species, but this one really is something special with a cool and deceptively complicated camouflage. Let's meet the European Adder. <laughs> Before we get back into the rest of the video, I needed to swap dad for mom because dad was not cooperating and needed to be removed from the filming area. Anyways, the European adder is also known as the common adder, but why would I use that term, common adder? It's so pedestrian, and I like to think I enhance whatever I talk about, and I think that European adder is far classier, so I'm going to go with that. The European adder is a small diurnal species that typically gets about 60 centimeters long, as big as Johanna here, though some parts of their range might see snakes closer to a meter long. They are beautiful snakes sporting shades of beiges, browns, and grays, with a distinctive zigzaggy dorsal stripe. They are found across most of Eurasia, from northwest Europe, east all the way to the Pacific Ocean, from the Mediterranean Sea, north through Scandinavia, and past the Arctic Circle. They live farther north than any currently living reptile, and made the cut as one of my favorite cold tolerant reptiles. While venomous, the European adder is not generally considered especially dangerous. They are shy snakes that are reluctant to bite, and many bites that do occur are dry bites, meaning no venom is injected. Some questionable sources I have found suggest that they actually have the most toxic venom of any snake, but that is really not true, not even close. The inland taipan has the most potent venom and is about 55 times more deadly than the European adder. That said, their venom is still no joke, with an LD50 of 0.55 milligrams per kilogram, which is about twice as powerful as king cobras. LD50 is standardized measurement for determining toxicity. There are other ways to measure potency too, but LD50 is a pretty typical benchmark. It represents the median lethal dose, LD standing for lethal dose, and the 50 corresponds to 50%, the median. Basically, it tells us the dosage, usually in milligrams per kilogram of body mass, required to kill 50% of a test group. So if you have a group of, let's say, 100 mice, don't get attached to them, you'll see why in a minute, and you give them all five milligrams per kilogram of venom, and 50 of those 100 die, that was my reason, five milligrams is your LD50. The higher the LD50, the less toxic the venom is. For example, a North American copperhead with a relatively weak venom has an LD50 of almost 11 milligrams per kilogram, while its more deadly cousin, the timber rattlesnake, has an LD50 of 1.6, meaning it takes almost seven times as much copperhead venom to match the timber rattlesnakes in potency. For the sake of comparison, the inland taipan I mentioned earlier has an LD50 of 0.01 milligrams per kilogram. One one hundredth of a milligram. That's tiny, that's just a little pfft. That's nothing. A taipan's typical bite with a dose of 110 milligrams has enough venom to kill almost 300 humans in one bite. Overkill much? While nowhere near the potency of the taipan, the European adder's venom does deliver a wallop. It has the second most potent venom of the venomous snakes found in Europe, just behind the long-nosed viper, and packs twice the punch of the third most potent venom of the European asp, which is actually considered the more dangerous snake. So with such a strong venom, how is it that they're not considered especially dangerous? Well, I mentioned earlier that they are very shy and reluctant to bite, and when they do, most bites are dry bites. Venom is meant for food, after all, and that is not us. But the main reason that they aren't that dangerous is yield. The amount of venom that they have available to inject is very, very low. There is an expression, the dose makes the poison. 
that applies to venom too. Too much of anything, really, going into a bodily system can be toxic. Water, alcohol, heck, if you lined up a stalk of broccoli and injected it into your arm, it would probably kill you. In the European adder's case, while their venom is potent, they have very little of it and what you'd get in a bite would suck and be enough that you really should seek medical attention, but the odds of you actually dying, even without medical attention, are pretty slim. There are between 50 to 100 outer bites per year. The last fatality was almost 50 years ago. I'm not in any way suggesting that you should go out and harass adders or that you shouldn't be cautious around them because you definitely should, but there are definitely way scarier snakes out there. Okay, this video was supposed to be about their camouflage, not all this other foofara. So we really should get to it. But I'm curious, did you like our little venom detour? And would you like me to explore that a little bit more in a future video? If so, hit that little thumbs up button and let me know in the comments below. Liking and commenting really helps YouTube figure out if this video is worth showing to people other than you guys. And I really do also appreciate it. I also, also really appreciate these folks here. These are some of my patrons on Patreon. Through the support of these fine folks, I will be able to do more cool stuff on my channel, more enclosure builds for my reptiles, uh, maybe herping adventures to places other than southwestern Ontario, and all sorts of other neat stuff that I have planned. Updates that folks on YouTube or Instagram don't get to see, and more! If you'd like to lend your support, head on over to patreon.com slash allcanadianreptilegirl and check out what's available. Okay, let's get back to the camouflage. When you look at an animal in the wild, their appearance is not accidental. It is a product of generations of natural selection that gives the creature the optimal chances of surviving long enough to get busy and pass down those traits to their young and the next generation. There are different strategies that have evolved to accomplish this. Cryptic camouflage is an extremely useful one. This is where an animal uses a combination of colors, patterns, and behavior to blend into its surroundings to go unnoticed, either to sneak up on or ambush prey or to avoid being seen by a predator. Often it's both actually. A great example is the cryptic pattern of my dumeril's boas that perfectly blends into the leaf litter that they like to hide in and wait for prey. Other species use aposematic coloration. These creatures have found more success showing off than hiding, actually advertising their presence and that they are not something to be messed with. Very bright or high contrasting colors are used to notify potential predators that if they insist on getting up all in their face, they are in for a venomous bite or a sting or a hefty dose of poison if they are eaten. Think poison dart frog or a wasp or coral snakes, that kind of thing. Others still use Batesian mimicry where a harmless species will plagiarize the trademark look of a venomous creature to trick predators into thinking that they too are the dangerous and the predator will leave them alone. A harmless corn snake imitating a copperhead or a bull snake doing a rattlesnake impression. Some will mix and match. A copperhead's or corn snake's coloration blends into fallen leaves really well, but out in the open, exposed, the bright red and orange effectively advertises danger in the case of the copperhead. And for the corn snake, it's more like, uh, oh, oh yeah, but me too. I'm with that guy and super dangerous as well. Um, uh, boo. The European adder also doubles up on strategies with the beige, browns, and grays blending into the environment, but the prominent zigzag stripe on their back provides a high contrast, I might mess you up, warning sign. Even though they aren't all that bright and flashy, we know that this works as an effective deterrent to predators. Scientists over the past few decades have measured the frequency of predator attacks on model vipers made out of clay. These studies have shown predators attack clay snakes in the open far less if they have a zigzag stripe than if they are plain colored or if they have other stripe patterns. Evolutionary biologists out of Finland did another clay model experiment, swapping predators out for humans. This time, they hid the model snakes along a hiking trail and asked college students from biology field courses to identify as many as possible while they walked down the trail. These students were worse at finding the snakes with the zigzag stripes than the solid colored ones, indicating that the zigzag actually helps provide camouflage in addition to serving as a warning signal. But 
what if a savvy or especially keen-eyed predator managed to spot a European adder and, despite the warning of danger, attacked anyway? Could the viper zigzag stripe help it evade capture as well? Yes, it can and does. What researchers found is that European adders take advantage of an optical illusion called flicker fusion. It works like this. Imagine you are staring out the window on a long road trip watching the trees zoom by in the distance. If the trees are packed closely together, it is very difficult to distinguish individual trees or even determine which ones are closer or farther away from you. They probably appear to blur into a single brownish or greenish streak on the horizon rather than being distinguishable as individual objects. The same effect occurs with the zigzags of the viper. If the snake moves fast enough, the back and forth of the zigzag would blur into a diffuse longitudinal stripe. This pattern changing effect makes the fleeing snake more difficult to catch by reducing the ability of the predator to accurately judge the snake's speed, shape, size, location, and direction of travel. The zigzag pattern actually confuses predators. To test out the flicker fusion effect when hunting vipers, the researchers first had to measure how fast the snake could move, then calculate how many of the snake's light and dark color patches would pass by a single spot within one second. By comparing these calculations, to the measurements of various predators' flicker fusion thresholds, the maximum rate at which black and white stripes can speed by before they blur together, they determined that the European adders may use this visual illusion to help them elude capture by mammals, but is nowhere near as effective against birds. The zigzag of European adders can potentially protect them from being seen, attacked, and caught by predators. And even though some predators may overcome a single defense, they are unlikely to hurdle all three. Gim flush, warning, and flicker fusion. So if you happen to see one of these amazing creatures on your travels, you can now not only admire their beautiful zigzag pattern from an aesthetic perspective, but you now know that it also helps contribute to three powerful methods of remaining uneaten. How cool is that? Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed learning a little more about the European adder. I know I've covered them a fair bit pretty recently with my folklore video and cool tolerant reptiles, but I think they kind of fly under the radar and don't get talked about enough. They were one of my favorite species of snakes before I learned all sorts of other cool stuff about them. And in my opinion, their stock has only gone up. Thanks again for hanging out with me. And until next time, remember to nurture all nature. Bye. Look, just, shh. Anyways. Black was white. Keep him here. Okay. We're looking for a home, if anyone's interested. Other species use aposematic coloration. These creatures, why does it say creatures? I don't know why I wrote it that way. These creatures.